Good morning and welcome. My name's Camilla Toulmin, and I'm the director of the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED. We're based in London. Welcome to our participants here in Paris, where I have to say it looks like true London weather, quite cold and grey. <laughs> Welcome also to our audience online on the live stream. Soyez le bienvenu. We will run this session in both English and French. So for those of you with headsets, French is on six. English is on seven. Please speak slowly so that the translators can follow and translate what you say. This is a, a real meeting of Francophone and British intellectual and linguistic cultures. Um, we're looking at a topic called Making Markets Work for the Poor, Contents and Discontents. And this is the third event in a series of provo provocations or disputations following a meeting held in The Hague in September of last year and one in Stockholm in March earlier this month. It's a series of meetings as part of a collaborative program of work between IIED, HIVOS and a whole range of local partners. And the purpose of this work is to try and take a closer look at this idea of making markets work for the poor. What are some of the benefits? What are some of the assumptions? What are some of the risks in market-based approaches to reducing poverty, particularly amongst small-scale farmers? We hope this series of provocations will provide new insights grounded in work happening here and now with small-scale farmers in the developing world to help provoke those working in these fields to rethink whether and how markets can indeed work for the poor. Let me just say a couple of words about myself. I'm a economist turned anthropologist who's worked mainly in Sahelian West Africa. Markets have been hugely important throughout West Africa for hundreds, actually thousands of years. I've followed for the last 30 years the life of a small village in central Mali and I was back there earlier this month. People have become hugely engaged in markets, particularly over the last few years for sesame. Sesame is making a lot of people there really quite rich. So they're very engaged, but they're also mindful of the risks involved in that. Risks because many households are tempted to put so much of their time and energy into sesame that they're not thinking about how their longer term food security around millet might be assured. Risks because young, young men are sloping off from the field, the family field, early in the evening to go and farm their own sesame plot for their own private purpose and arriving in the family field the following morning exhausted and not fit for work. So it's a good example, I think, that brings to life some of the real benefits of engagement in market with some of the risks particularly for household solidarity um, and food security. We have one change to the list of speakers. Um, sadly, Ujwal Pokrel, our colleague from Nepal, is not well and has been unable to join us. But I'm delighted that a colleague from Burkina Faso, Balasanu, has been ably willing to step into his place Ballas from the Royal Tropical Institute in the Netherlands, and we're really pleased, Bala, that you could take on that role. I'd now like to turn to Catherine van der Wies from HIVOS to say a few words. My name is um, Catherine. 
My name is Catherine Vennevis. I work for HIFOS, which is an uh, international uh, NGO based in the Netherlands. Uh, we cooperate with IED uh, on this uh, program, and it's part of uh, HIFOS' uh, knowledge program, uh, which consists of a, a global learning network with uh, persons from all over the world, uh, which is led from Bolivia. And the theme of the program is small-scale producers in a globalized uh, market. Uh, there are different uh, themes, one on uh, policies, regional trade agreements and small producer agency, the second on public and private institutional arrangements that promote small-scale producers agency in their economic organizations and value chains, and the third one is other markets, informality, economic rationali uh, rationalities and small other agency. Some of the network people were present in the, um, uh, the first uh, provocation uh, in The Hague. And I hope uh, a lot of them are also um, following us on stream. Uh, why are we um, cooperating, uh, engaging in the provocations in Europe? Uh, for uh, HIFOS, of course, uh, working with the poor is, is very important. And also uh, linking small scale um, smallholders to the markets is a very important theme for us. Uh, but we don't want to engage in it um, without the, the knowledge that uh, is needed to really make it work uh, for the smallholders, because there's still a lot of doubt whether they really uh, benefit from this. And um, if we are not overlooking, for instance, women, if we look at smallholders, many programs are looking at men. They don't look at the other half, which are the women. So they are often also not included. So how inclusive uh, are we really? And of course, uh, we are also uh, running the risk of um, excluding uh, indigenous groups or people without land, which will be discussed uh, today. Uh, so for us, it's very much uh, knowledge production, integration, dissemination uh, on key problems uh, that are affecting uh, the poor and particularly smallholders' access to markets. Um, we think it's very important to discuss this in Europe uh, because uh, here there's a lot of debate and policies made on smallholders which are really affecting the smallholders in, in developing countries. Um, so that's why HIFOS uh, in this process also aims to reflect on its own role uh, as an international organization and on its existing activities around the topic. Um, each provocation works on different hosting partners in each country. For this seminar, uh, we work with uh, SNV and IRAM. And uh, Joost Nalen um, on my left will uh, welcome you further. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, uh, Catherine. Um, je m'appelle Joost Nalen. Je travaille pour l'organisation néerlandaise développement, la SNV. Je suis basé à Burkina Faso. Reste, je parlerai en, en anglais. So Joost Nelen, uh, working for the Netherlands Development Organization, SNV. Um, like, uh, like Camilla, main, main, most of my work uh, is in West Africa, and my home area is also a little bit Mali. Um, but since a uh, couple of years, I'm also corporate uh, network leader for agriculture in SNV. So I try to have also kind of a, a worldwide uh, view on, on agriculture. Um, when Bill Foley and the others from IED and uh, Hivos asked uh, SMV to join uh, the band. It was somewhere after a bottle of wine, somewhere in Fort Portal in Uganda. And, and we immediately said yes. It was a very good and nice ID from Hivos and IED. So it, it's an honor for SMV to, to join this uh, series of uh, provocative uh, uh, s seminars. The step, second step to do was um, then to, to get in the French speaking world because we are one of the big areas we're working in is, is uh, uh, West and Central Africa, and most of the time we discuss debate in French. So, um, Iram was a little kind of natural and very appropriate partner to host this uh, third seminar. So I'm glad that SNV today with Iram can host this uh, this seminar. Um, market for the poor. All the other people will introduce more the content. Jerome will introduce, uh, uh, especially on on, on filière. So I'll we'll give you some yells yells uh, um, from my, from my side. Um, what we have seen, what we have doing is this a kind of if this deliver the kind of exciting um, new practice, experience, insights, maybe 
or is it like my uh, my colleague from Cambodia told, told me is the is the market for boy just a Ferrari on a dirt road, just a fancy car on a sentier on Bruce quelque part? Um, I don't know, maybe both, maybe neither of it. I hope we can find this out today. Maybe we can debate it. Uh, Allons-y discuter tout ça. Je passe la parole maintenant à Jérôme. Merci. Merci, Joost. My name is Jérôme Coste, uh, uh, the head of IRAM. Uh, for more than 50 years, uh, we have uh, worked to support rural development and local development uh, in uh, uh, countries of the South. Uh, since the beginning, we wanted to combine, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we wanted to have technical assistance, consulting, but we also uh, always wanted to think about the processes and the approaches. Um, now, uh, we've been working with SNV for some time now, and when they asked us to take part in this uh, conference, we thought it was a good opportunity to think about our practice and to compare the way we work with the way other organizations work in the field of uh, uh, support uh, to uh, smallholders and agricultural markets. We uh, know uh, IED very well also, and we've been working with them in Western Africa. Now, a few words uh, about uh, this uh, conference today. Now, uh, it is, in fact, uh, a bit commonplace to say that we need to invest in agriculture to reduce uh, poverty in countries of the South. Uh, but. Uh, it wasn't as uh, mundane to say this uh, uh, something like uh, 10 years ago. I mean, you remember at the end of the 90s, beginning of the year 2000, investments in this sector had uh, uh, dropped. But in the face uh, of different e e e events, like the food crisis in 2008, 2009, uh, which could reoccur today with the uh, uh, ups and downs of uh, food prices on the international market. So it is in the face of this that new interest has been devoted to the agricultural uh, sector and especially uh, smallholders. Um, and it is in this context that a certain number of organizations, cooperation agencies, uh, non-governmental organizations and others have decided to develop approaches combining uh, uh, market uh, approaches uh, in favor of the poor. In fact, um, the uh, idea was to develop, uh, in fact, what was called around 2005 by the World Bank, the pro poor uh, growth, uh, and uh, more specifically in the agricultural sector. So. Uh, the British and Swedish cooperation agencies have worked on this, and they, in fact, insist on a certain number of points, uh, connecting smallholders to the markets, uh, in fact, uh, uh, giving a, a priority to niche markets, uh, and uh, here they look at opportunities on export markets. And another thing characterizing the approaches is to focus on the private sector and to make it an essential partner in the development uh, uh, process. And we talk about inclusive business to get a, a win-win situation between the uh, smallholders and those companies responsible for uh, processing and marketing their agricultural products. So these approaches were used uh, everywhere uh, and uh, in different forms. Uh, and. Uh, uh, they have been the object, and this you can see I I in the flyers available to you, they have been the object of criticisms. Uh, among these criticisms, we find the following. First of all, these approaches do not always take into account the uh, 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 vulnerable uh, uh, nature of uh, some uh, uh, parties, like women, uh, uh, ethnical minorities, uh, and uh, these vulnerable uh, groups, uh, in fact, uh, 
uh, find themselves uh, in a very risky situation and depend on weather conditions and things like that. So uh, uh, people say that those people cannot always uh, respond to market signals. Another criticism that is made is that those niche markets that have been privileged are uh, small markets and therefore their impact will be too uh, weak and cannot really reduce the great poverty we find in some rural areas. Another group of criticisms uh, uh, covers the tension between the interests of the uh, small uh, holders and uh, uh, the producer organizations and the interests uh, of the uh, companies downstream. The win-win scenario, uh, in fact, uh, are not always there in the end. So before I give the floor to the different speakers here, and since we are in Paris, and since IRAM is a French-speaking organization, I would like to say a few words about what uh, brings together and what separates the uh, market for the pure, poor uh, or the uh, French uh, agricultural uh, sectoral approach. Now, uh, uh, there uh, are different approaches, and we thought it would be interesting to talk about the common points and differences. Uh, the, the French uh, uh, approach dates back to 40 years ago uh, when we analyzed uh, uh, agriculture in France and also in developing countries. And at the time, in the 70s, we focused on uh, uh, looking at the added value between the different uh, uh, people, players uh, in a sector, that is to say, from the production to uh, uh, the retailing. And we looked at the distribution of added value because we uh, wanted to better understand uh, 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 the uh, national economy uh, looking at uh, uh, the accounting. And if we look at uh, the uh, uh, cotton uh, growing at the time, there was a big, big intervention of the state. So when we look at the generation of uh, value creation, this had a meaning because the state uh, held many levers uh, uh, in this sector. But this is no longer the case today. If we look at the present situation, we can see different common points between the value chain approach uh, and the French uh, sectoral approach. Uh, the first uh, uh, thing is uh, to uh, look at uh, what we call the neoclassic uh, economy. And now, in the face of market imperfections uh, that characterize the agricultural markets on developing countries, the assumptions of the neoclassic economy uh, do not uh, work. Therefore, it is necessary to look uh, at the way these markets uh, work. And the two uh, schools, in fact, uh, refer today to uh, what we call the new institutional economy that in, is defended by Williamson, which is based on looking at the transaction costs that are uh, generated by the difference in information and by the market risks uh, that confront the different players. Let me recall that this school of thought pays a lot of attention to the way uh, players in a sector, in a chain, coordinate their actions to organize the whole process between uh, production, processing, retailing. And in both cases, there's a desire to look at reality and not just to describe the symptoms, but also to find the causes. Now, a few words about the differences. Uh, we will note that the uh, uh, French type of sectoral approach will devote more time to looking at the problems of uh, suppliers. Uh, we'll uh, also pay more attention to quality, which is considered as crucial for coordination between the different players, and we'll also pay a lot of attention to market regulation, that is to say, to 
the uh, specific role of a spot market, collective action, including uh, those of uh, the professional organizations, and the role of the public sector, and how this can uh, combine or be combined to, in fact, uh, uh, correct uh, market uh, imperfections. In the uh, value chain approach, uh, uh, people will more focus on demand and satisfying customer needs. Uh, and uh, the uh, 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 Concerning the inclusive business, well, there will be a, a selection uh, uh, that will be uh, done based on competition. So on the one side, you have demand competition. On the other side, you have uh, the uh, supply and market regulation. And now I have three questions uh, to put to you today. Uh, uh, we would like to know how the approaches market for the poor take into account uh, these theoretical references and what do they uh, uh, mean to uh, establish the, the programs called markets for the poor and uh, what is their idea of market? Of course, we could discuss about the poors, but we should discuss the markets. Uh, what makes the market? Who is the market? I think you've laid out very clearly for us some of the main lines of the intellectual scene, and you've reminded me why it's always such a pleasure for us in Britain to work with our French colleagues. So thank, thank you. you for that. <laughs> Let me introduce now the main uh, the main play, if you like, which is going to be in two parts. The first part will be um, started by two speakers, followed by uh, a discussion. Uh, these two speakers will, ad will address the challenges of implementing in practice ways of making markets work for the poor. And these will be based on very practical examples of how you set up businesses and what some of the difficulties of setting up those businesses can be when you try to link smallholder farmers to markets. The first speaker will be Olivier Renard from IRAM here in France. And the second will be Ham van Udenhoven, who's coordinator of the Tropical Commodity Coalition in the Netherlands. Each of the speakers will have a maximum of 15 minutes. After 12 minutes, my colleague Sarah here will start waving at you. After 15 minutes, we'll take away your mic. <laughs> we'll then, after the two presentations, we'll then have 30 minutes of open debate. This is not a question and answer session. This is a debate where you, all of you, we want you to participate, to get involved. Um, you can have a maximum of three minutes for an intervention or for posing a question to um, the rest of the participants. We'll also be pulling in online questions. And my colleagues over there on the, um, on the web will be bringing those questions to us. We'll then have a short coffee break, and then we'll move into the second act of our play before wrapping up at one o'clock. I'll ask our two um, presenters here to speak slowly so that we can get the translation as effective as possible. So let me pass over first to Olivier Renard. Merci, Camilla. Donc, je vais parler en français. So, thank you. Let me take you to Vietnam and China, where indeed it was a pleasure to work in the bamboo field in 2008 and 2009. I worked with the GRET at the time, and which has, I find, an approach which is very similar to IRAM. So it was quite easy actually to make that transition and learn all that I'm going to share with you today. So this project that I'm going to speak to you about was a partnership between two partners who had a very different approach, a very different vision on this market to the poor business. So as I was saying, we were two partners. And if we worked together, we had, however, a very different approach. But finally, we set up our partnership. However, it fell apart because of the major difference between us. And I'll 
I'm going to explain that all to you and show you the obstacles that we ran into, the showstoppers, which might be useful for you here today. So the project that we partnered on had an idea of having a large-scale impact by penetrating the international bamboo market by producing high-value added uh, products. So we were trying to react to demand by providing high-quality products and improving the entire uh, system. So the uh, basic assumption was that we use the Chinese model as a base, which is very efficient and very high performance in the uh, bamboo sector. So the idea was to take away some of its um, market share and have a platform in Vietnam. So now what was this Chinese um, sector all about? Now in the 80s, there were several processing areas for bamboo in the NG area, which is to the west of Shanghai. And these are small bamboo producing areas. And in 2008, there were 1,600 such units, you know, very active um, units, and also a lot of people, 35,000 people, 50,000 producers, including 35,000 who were processors or uh, uh, pr producers worked in this field. What's more, it was very strongly supported by the Chinese government way back when through all sorts of various reforms which gave it a lot of advantages. So you had bamboo societies that were set up, and these were uh, associations that took into account all the problems that people involved in the bamboo trade uh, were going through, having them work together. And they set up specific contracts with the private and public um, uh, sectors, which had a different meaning at different points in time. Anyway, they had the backing of the government. Plus, uh, they had large-scale trials running over several thousands of hectares to improve their uh, bamboo production. And what's more, they were marking their bamboo just to ensure that they were improving their bamboo growth. We had the tax uh, um, help as well, tax uh, exemptions for what we call the bamboo corridor. So there was a lot of money also coming in from the overseas uh, Chinese uh, in Hong Kong and so on who were coming in to buy the products and finance it. So this was a very dynamic agricultural cluster, uh, very in intense, very compact, and which was considered a great model. However, it masked certain inequalities, which was pointed out by the various researchers in the field, particularly very cheap uh, uh, labor, which uh, came from the east of China and contributed towards the wealth of this area. And the very poor people also weren't involved. So it really helped the higher classes, the middle classes and the rich, rich people, but not the very poor. So in Vietnam, how were we to reproduce uh, this same scenario? So let me explain it to you. The area we were working in was uh, extremely uh, shut in with a lot of ethnic minorities. Now, the producers did not really process the bamboo as such. Uh, we didn't have that advantage as of China. Bamboo was not a priority for the local authorities either, so it was just the poor people who were handling the bamboo themselves, and they weren't necessarily given the required support from the authorities. What's more, there weren't any large-scale reforms either to develop this section. So then there was a sort of war effort made over there, and a lot of um, forests were replanted with bom bamboo. But once that was done, there was nothing else that was really pumped into the bamboo sector. No money was uh, provided. So in the 19, there were just a few SMEs, SMIs that existed. So the macroeconomic uh, section was also not that favorable. You know, in the past, there was world growth, which was really pushing everybody ahead. But um, in this period, there was nobody. So bamboo management was not sustainable either, and it wasn't well done, as in China. You didn't really have that system of markers. What's important for bamboo is that it's just the same height at one year, four years, or you know the next uh, six years. So you can cut it for building and construction, but for high-value-added uh, high um, um, products, you have to wait another three years. But that's very difficult to ask the peasants to wait an extra three years. In China, it's easy, but not in Vietnam. So when we were trying to uh, increased pressure on this particular bamboo growth. So the pressure just spilled over onto the producers and there was no sustainable growth anymore. So now what happened? Right, so maybe I was going a little fast, so I'm slowing down now. <laughs> Let me explain what happened to you. When we wish to reproduce the Chinese model in Vietnam, which had a completely different context and backdrop, 
There was, as I explained, a partnership. The GRET, the G-R-E-T, uh, was then and is still uh, helping the local small businesses with their uh, growth and also find new sustainable systems of growth for bamboo, find new partners for them. And on the other hand, they were trying to draw in huge investment, working therefore with uh, big companies around Hanoi or other international companies who would come in and set up uh, processing lines, processing units to make uh, flooring, buildings, etc., based on bamboo, and therefore convert it into a high value added product. Uh, we realized, however, that it wasn't working as we wanted it to, because on the one hand, industrialists were very hesitant about coming to this area where the resources as such were not secure. And um, what's more, there were, wasn't very good quality bamboo. So bamboo that came into factories was just a year old and not two years old. It wouldn't be a problem for flooring or for um, furniture. However, they were very hesitant. They didn't wish to invest in this poor quality raw material in the plantations, in the units, and so on. So very few investors uh, came. So they worked with the local Vietnamese uh, um, uh, producers and investors. And the working methods were not similar to that of a sustainable economy. That was the first major point. And secondly, it was more theoretical. We wish to increase demand you know, in order to have some impact on prices and also ensure that the peasants selling bamboo would also take advantage of it. But in real life, it wasn't really like that. Bamboo prices were determined by China, which was just to the north of them. So if the pr prices were low, then Vietnam couldn't sell its bamboo at a higher price since the Chinese market determined price. What's more, the distribution of margins right from upscale to uh, upstream to downstream of the production was not in the hands of uh, the producers. And what's more, even on Vietnam markets, there was just not enough demand to have any change in prices. So if 80% goes into the building and construction industry, and if you go from 10 to 15% of high added value products, it really has no impact on uh, the price paid out to the peasants. So, so that was a major problem. Apart from that, there was also the organization. The producer's organization is very necessary to have good quality supply. And if you don't have that, then you invest a lot to make it happen. Now, who does it? Uh, you have to make sure that uh, both organizations have to be compatible with each other, the investors and the producers. Investors were rare, as we had explained to you, especially those who wish to invest over a long period of time. Plus, we discovered that uh, the Vietnamese country uh, companies had a very different point of view on resources. They didn't really have that sustainable approach, uh, which is what we wanted for market for the poor in that framework. And that gave rise to all sorts of problems. What, however, when we looked at what was happening at a local level with all the support provided for the small businesses, we realized that there were certain concrete results. The small industries that were working together and who were networked were more shock resistant. So if we found opportunities to diversify production on the local markets, it helped them enormously and it helped their economic model. What's more, they were able to uh, ride the crest of uh, the crisis much better. What, what else we did was um, improve uh, a good management of the plantations within all the little uh, cooperatives and groups. So we managed to improve the plantations and therefore get them better prices. Uh, through the small industries who were looking for better quality. So if we helped them, we realized, at that small level, which was small, but it was very significant because it spread over a wide scale, we could change things. However, it was very difficult. It's still underway. It's a long, long uh, way to go. But now we are developing methods which might just work. And finally, from the political point of view, we realized as uh, we went along that um, they were trying to um, increase local investment, help the local enterprises, and help the most, uh, the poorest of the population through teaching and making uh, bamboo growing areas easier to use. So that was a lot of investment made by the government. However, this Im um, could have a major impact on the investment only if they took interest in it. So there was this long dialogue with the local government to 
encourage them to coerce them into making these uh, investments because otherwise they would be missing an opportunity. We found in our various um, experiences in this area that, that the poor or the producers, because very often producers in this area are very poor, that if they aren't at the very heart of the market, then there are major risks. That is, the investment burden falls on the investors. The investors come, they set up something, and then in the long run, you ask the producer to adapt to the new changes, the new uh, models, so without providing any kind of safety network. So there's a major risk attached to this market for the poor approach, you know, which was meant to be a big explosion, make a big bang, you know, and ensure that we wipe out uh, poverty. But finally, it wasn't justified in its um, way of working. You have to take into account the um, specificities of uh, family agriculture, which is not market-oriented, because it was really just meant for the local family. Here, too, you have all sorts of uh, impact on the uh, households, on the household model, etc., where certain ways of production are just dropped uh, to turn towards new uh, ways of production, and that's a risk. Apart from that, uh, all these uh, these poor neglected areas require long-term investment, particularly in the framework of projects. You know, often they have just a short-term view, three, four, five years, and beyond that, there's no more financing. So apart from that, though we had a long-term um, view in our partnership, we had a budgetary cut also. So in the final analysis, we didn't have a long-term intervention in the area. And in the long run, you cannot guarantee the sort of stuff. So that's an important point uh, because both in the private sector and in the public sector, long-term investment is required. But market forces change all the time. So I felt this uh, external intervention is important and also make sure that local investment and growth is really helped. In conclusion, since that is really the theme of the discussion today, let me ask you two rather provocative uh, questions for your reactions later. Firstly, this market for the poor approach, is it really neutral from the ideological point of view? Once you put the market at the very heart of the system and if you think it's going to be a solution, is that, very objectively speaking, uh, something that will really work? Or are there certain ideological forces that give us to adopt this sort of position in our um, approach to development? And secondly, this developmental aid as it exists today, is it really fitted out to help territorial development in the long term as it should be? Because the developmental tools which are specific to a given sector of uh, economy or monoproduct uh, or in an area which is rather uh, restrictive, can it really work in an inter on an international level. Don't you think we should have a model that is a little more systemic with a, a theme-based approach or a product-based approach or have an overview, really a global an overview of it? So with the present aid that we have, can we really make sure that we will go along these lines? Right, I have finished. I'm sorry if I spoke too fast. quick, but you've kept exactly to time. So that's uh, an example that uh, we can hope that maybe our other disputants will also, will also follow. Thank you also for concluding with a couple of questions for us to think about. And I, I don't want to throw open to the floor yet because um, I want us to turn to our other speaker in order to hear from, from him about the case study from Nicaragua. Okay. So, Harm, over to you. Okay, this will be in English. Um, okay, uh, my name is Harm van Oudenhoven, and I ran my own chocolate business in Nicaragua. So, um, okay, I'm just going to, I wrote a nice speech here. <laughs> okay, establishing and running a business in many developing countries is a very complicated and frustrating task. One is confronted with antiquated bureaucracies, unfriendly tax systems, complicated and contradictory laws. The terrible infrastructure, roads and roads in bad condition and dangerous traffic make transport and logistics costly and difficult. 
you know, power shortages and outages can run, ruin a day's production or in the long run ruin your business. A low standard of general education makes it difficult to find good staff and this is also reflected in the low standards of services. In an effort to stimulate economic growth, many NGOs have started to become actors in stimulating various enterprises. Often they examine the production chain of a single commodity and intervene in where the analysis shows restraints and complications. A relatively recent strategy amongst NGOs is, the, is to connect large and often international businesses to producer organizations such as pharma cooperatives. The reasoning is that large companies can have a better and larger impact due to their size and the related large demand of a single commodity. And there are of course many examples where small-scale pharma organizations profit from such an initiative and the large companies do likewise. However, in both the analysis and in the intervention strategies along value change, large sections of the total network of economic actors related or potentially related are left out of the picture and do not benefit from the interventions. It can even be the case that the interventions can have a negative effect on the overall economy. It is therefore of, therefore of considerable importance in seeking to find answers for economic development or for making markets work for the poor, for NGOs to look beyond specific value chains and to look at the broader economic system. The restraints that are causing economic lag for the whole economy should be considered and acted upon to create a level playing field for all actors. Okay, I, re I, I wish to read to you a narrative on my personal experience of running a, my own business in Nicaragua. I do so because I feel it's the best way to explain my thoughts regarding initiatives of NGOs. Okay, gracias. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up with him here. <laughs> okay, I undertook uh, my latest endeavor uh, because I wished to prove that I could set up a successful business without too much planning and without a theoretical backdrop and uh, with very limited finance. Uh, the business had to be original and bring something new to the local economy, while at the same time using many, as many local resources, resources as possible. I hope that by starting my own business in a developing country, I would get a full and realistic insight into the problems faced by local businesses and in future use this knowledge in a professional way. Of course, I hope to have an impact, creating jobs in a sustainable manner. Okay. So when my wife uh, actually got a job uh, for SNV in Nicaragua, I saw my chance to start a new business. And while driving around the countryside, I found uh, cacao trees with cacao rotting on the floor, on the ground. So I actually that gave me the input to you know, make a new business. I, and I thought, well, maybe I could do something with chocolate. So I started to experiment to see if I could make chocolate at home. I spent a few weeks mixing cacao and sugar and milk powders and made some of the worst chocolate in the world. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And I kept trying, I kept trying. And when I, I was eventually satisfied with a number of products, I went to the local pizzeria and offered them uh, the chocolate. The owner called me the next day and asked for more. So I invested my last 3,000 euros I had in the bank and made a small kitchen and I bought some machinery, some trays and a stove and established a small production unit. So basically at the level of many local producers, you know, very little money, very little input. And I hired my first kitchen staff and taught her the basics and I sold prod the products in town and some specialty shops in the capital. And the production slowly grew, and my sales slowly grew, and two friends, we were all development workers, invested 6,000 6, euros, and we, and we increased the size of the kitchen. We wrote a business plan, and we won 20,000 euros for the best business plan for development, um, and used this to, to again improve the kitchen and buy our company car. Um, I spent weeks, days, placing our products in the local market, local supermarkets, gasoline stations, and any restaurants that would take our product. We participated in trade fairs throughout the country and promoted our chocolate at city festivals. And through the years, our brand became known to more and more people. And slowly we grew in size and slowly we established our market. Slowly, we also became aware of the immense constraints that are put, up, that are put on local businesses of our size and capacity. And the constraints are immense. Starting, registration of the facility as a legal ent entity took months. Working with local lawyers, we soon discovered that many mistakes, we soon discovered many mistakes in the texts. Our names were spelled wrong. The goal of the company was incorrectly described. Erroneous legal terms were used. We actually wrote out our legal documents ourselves with the lawyers only signing and pasting the official tax stamp. <laughs> yeah. It took many more weeks to setting things straight at the tax office. The Chamber of Commerce had approved the original document. However, a contradictory law at the tax office forced us to rewrite our business constitution. And this contradiction still bothers us today. We have to show the two consecutive documents for any legal transaction or bank or government agency. Strikes at the Ministry of Health going on for 11 months prevented, 
prevented us from getting health certificates. Together, efforts to obtain individual approvals and certificates needed for national sales of chocolate took, in the end, more than 18 months. We wish to produce, when we wish to produce for an international recognized, uh, for an international market, our, we had our chocolate tested at the, at, um, for nutritional information by the Ministry of Health. The results were full of errors and contradictions. In the third year of business, the national power cuts started. Six hours a day, eight hours a day, and when we finally sent our staff home, zero hours a day. <laughs> this lasted for two years. Telephone lines were stolen on a regular basis. The roads were, of course, horrendous. The times we stood by the roadside with a flat tire are not countable. The repair bills for our old Nissan patrol are simply unimaginable. And the list goes on. Information at the staff of the Ministry of Agriculture were very limited. When we wished to export to USA or to Europe, it was up to ourselves to find the information needed in various websites or simply by trial and error. We found that the Department of Export Certification and National Customs Offices lacked an organized, organized information system. And this can make doing business very difficult. One is sent back again and again and again for some missing paper, a photocopy or of a legal document or a legal stamp. And we came from three hours away from the capital, so this was a very costly affair. Errors made by the same agencies in documentation cost us hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Two exports last year failed simply due to spelling mistakes. We also lost our customers and a lots of money, of course. There was, however, one cons uh, consolation. It didn't only happen to us. It happened, <laughs> yeah, this was the situation for every business, small or big. We all suffered from an inadequacy of inf information, the sloppiness of government, the insecurities of energy supply, and a terrible infrastructure. But all things said, we had become a business in Nicaragua. Okay, listening uh, to the above, you, it might come to your, your attention that I do not mention any theoretical framework or production chain analysis. This is because we ne actually never used one. Almost everything we planned turned out more difficult, more complicated than any model could predict. <laughs> it was simply getting things done that needed to be done by any means possible. The work contained a lot of physical labor, from lowering sacks to caca of cacao from the top of a bus to unloading chocolate at a supermarket delivery point. It also meant intervening at the moment, grabbing chances, having alternatives when plan A, B, and C did not make it through the day. So throughout the years of management and consumed by all the practicalities of keeping the business afloat, I often had discussions with NGO business advisors on a friendly or professional basis. I noticed more and more that the theories and models, and I, I do mention the value chain, seemed less and less relevant to my case. Not only could these models not help my business, but they also seemed not to include multiple aspects that were essential in keeping the business going and growing. And this is not to say that economic theories and analysis have no place to describe a production system. But in explaining reality, they often fall short. In my view, most analysis of production and value chains are too linear and do not include all the actors and factors, the whole network that influences a business and enables it to function. Many models simply envision a straight line from farmer to cooperative to export market, running su and running a successful business requires a far larger oversight. So what was our relationship with NGOs? Uh, well, our company was very interested in the overall development of, of the cacao <coughs> sector, and we, had, and we made contact with NGOs. And actually, together with SNV, we organized the first NGO and cacao cooperative meeting at our premises. And we talked about a multi-stakeholder approach to stimulate the production of quality cacao through a new purchasing scheme, paying more for quality, finding buyers in the export market, and setting up training schemes for cacao producers. We, El Castillo del Cacao, that's our company, wrote a plan, and we shared this with the NGOs. And we did this especially with one, uh, I'm not going to name NGO, um, <laughs> that had a growing interest in the cacao sector. And as we worked along, it soon became apparent that the foreseen NGO support was not what it had promised to be. One, first of all, no NGO ever offered to pay for our knowledge and time. And from the many NGOs with whom we shared our information, not one came back and shared their completed reports. On the contrary, it became clear that we were slowly but surely being excluded from the debate or any program. For example, two weeks before signing a contract to buy large quantities of cacao from two cooperatives, the unnamed uh, NGO, which I mentioned before, organized a meeting with all the cacao cooperatives with a large German chocolate company. The only organization not invited was us. Yeah? This organization had simply copy-pasted our plan and found their own investor. They had their network, raised prices above that we offered to pay, and took over the cacao trade in northern Nicaragua. Our good friends from this organization that used to drop by every, every week 
stopped coming and they smiled at us sheepishly as we met in the streets. This initiative by this unnamed organization <laughs> totally ruined the possibility for us to become a cacao exporter. It also thwarted the initiatives of some other traders to start exporting cacao. The traders from El Salvador and Costa Rica were driven from the market. Furthermore, bo furthermore, both our company and one other chocolate company in Nicaragua suddenly found it very difficult to source quality cacao at a reasonable price. At this very moment, our company is still having difficulty sourcing quality cacao as the German company is buying almost all cacao available in our area of operation. It seriously, seriously affects our business. So having experienced this at first hand and not you know, trying to pull it all to my, uh, my company, um, I examined attitudes amongst other private businesses, asking, asking their opinions of NGO-led initiatives. It soon became clear that opinions among private businesses were not all favorable to the actions of NGOs. Not in the past or in the present, many talked of being led on by NGOs with promises of e easy finance, and after sharing information, both their suppliers and customers had been taken over by the NGO initiatives that worked to support individual pharma cooperatives. There was a strong feeling that international NGOs had their own agenda, more engaged with showing results that had favor in their own countries, we are helping poor farmers, than actually having a broader impact in the local economy. Now, I do not say that NGOs have a, have a policy to damage local business, no. I'm, however, of the opinion that with a simple value chain approach and acting to improve the restraints he found herein, we missed a broader perspective, and we can certainly have a negative impact with our interventions. Now, to go back to the example of cacao chain analysis in Nicaragua, all the cacao chain studies that I came across followed the same pattern. Cacao moved from cacao farmer to cooperative, from cooperative to export agency, and the rest of the chain was placed in Europe or the USA, where the processing packaging of, of cacao to chocolate takes place. And the constraints were identified so that the NGO could concentrate its program to improve the flow along the chain. So farmers had to be trained to improve quality, and all studies showed that they need to directly link pharma cooperatives to big business, as this would cut out the middleman and give better prices to farmers. And this is also the case in many studies for coffee and other export commodities. But the studies lacked, in my perspective, many important aspects. In all studies I came across on cacao and chocolate, not one touched upon the importance of cacao in the traditional economy. Cacao has played for thousands of years or more an essential role in Central American economies. Today, millions of people still drink cacao and corn-based drinks that have nothing to do with chocolate. I know of no NGO that has actually put time and effort into improving the cacao production for the use in Pinot Leo, this local drink. Yeah? No study looked at the potential for the local production and market for chocolate. It seemed that if cacao could be produced by farmers and exported at a reasonable price, development goals would be achieved. The importance of the middle class, consisting of small and medium enterprises in a developing economy, economy seemed to be irrelevant. Another aspect that also came to the forefront was the lack of analysis of local economic constraints that hamper doing business in general. It was as if, as if local tax systems, business laws and infrastructure were all a given, not something that could be influenced or changed. Yeah, okay, it's going to take two, mi two minutes. As the analysis was often linear and value chain specific, the solutions proposed were also aimed directly at improving the chain and few, if any, on improving the general business environment beneficial to all enterprises. So, I find that even if we may improve the flow along a certain chain, there can be a negative effects to other actors in the total network of the economy or to those businesses that fall outside the, uh, the analyzed supported chain. Okay, therefore, one of the most worrying aspects I find today is that NGOs are linking um, with international businesses in the line with export-directed value chain improvement. Although the effects may be positive for farmers, little remains to be developed in the local economy when all produce is ex exported. With an international business dominating the local market, do dominating the local market, the development of local traders is bypassed. The higher quality produce is exported, leaving potential local producers with inferior product and often with a shortage. Of course, multinational businesses are always active in expanding their markets and are in general very aggressive, often overrunning small and medium business in a developing country. This is normal. But my concern is now that NGOs are using scarce development resources to support such international business in the actions to take over local markets. And this under the motto of supporting poor farmers or small-scale producers, while in actual fact, the multinationals are often the real winners. So what should, we, should be the direction that NGOs should take? If you wish to strengthen or support local businesses, be it small-scale farmers or private business, 
businesses, NGOs, should work towards an enabling environment for business at, local, at, at the local economies. Help to change business laws, tax systems, and I import and export regulations. <laughs> Concentrate on education so that the quality both within government and private sector increases, so no more spelling mistakes. You know, continue to train farmers and cooperatives on quality requirements and market potential of the produce, but train them to look for their own national and international customers. Establish information centers, centers at village or municipal level that are accessible to all, be it training centers for administrators or laboratories for testing produce for export. And NGOs could work to lobby for better infrastructure, and there's nothing really better than a good road to stimulate, stimulate economic growth. Mm. Mobile phone lines and internet are also close second. Energy supply, both in villages and towns, is of course essential. And if an NGO really does w want to work along a single value chain and link up with a large multinational in order to create that win-win situation, examine the cost benefit for all actors along this chain. Most likely, the actor that is to gain most is the multinational. And if so, let these comp companies cover the costs. NGOs have an incredible knowledge base, a large social local network ranging from producers to government actors. And this is something that companies are really willing to pay for. Now, Unilever had a profit of 4.7 billion last year. Nestle had a profit over, of over 10 billion dollars. They can surely put in their share. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, both sorry, sorry for the Olivier <laughs> and Harm. I think you've got us off to a very good start. Two very practical, grounded, hands-on examples of the complexity of markets. Um, showing the multiple hurdles you have to jump in order to make these markets work, and showing us that reality is really very different from the models that we have in our head. Um, we've now got um, until 11.15 to have um, a debate. So we've got microphones. We can push it to 11.30, fine, great. So that gives us the better part of, yeah, 30, 35 minutes. We've got microphones. We want you to use microphones, please, so that um, we can get the translation and also, of course, the, um, the uh, sound into the web system. When you stand up and say something, please can you give your name and say where you come from so that we've got a sense of who's in the room. So who'd like to... Who'd like to start off? If there are people who'd like to pose questions, um, particularly for any clarification on the presentations that we've heard. Julienne Brabet, University. Julienne Brabet, University Paris Est. Now, uh, I have heard. Uh, uh, the same comment made by both of you concerning uh, the making markets work. That is to say, if we don't start with uh, local development and if we don't have a systemic approach for the local level and if we immediately uh, uh, go for an export-driven uh, uh, economy, we miss the target, which is to alleviate uh, poverty. Did I understand you correctly? Yes, uh, uh, at least this is what we have seen in our experience. Uh, and uh, it's a question of approach, but also uh, time. The time frame is not the same. Uh, and this can also lead to problems. That is to say, if we put a lot of efforts on one initiative and it does not work, it will have a, 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 a very negative effect that will be, ah, we tried it, it didn't work. Well, the problem came from something else, uh, the way we actually did the thing. And this focus on international markets really takes the emphasis away from building local economy, local revenues, <coughs> local livelihoods. Yeah. Well, you know, on one side, of course, it helps. It, it, there's income coming into the country. But I will say, like, let's say if we develop one, one chain, let's say a banana exportation, uh, we kind of forget that these farmers might also want to produce something else in the future. So we, we can establish one chain, and then suddenly they want to do anything else, and then they're stuck again in their with their local constraints. That's why I keep focusing on we should 
try to improve the whole business environment in these countries so that people can develop themselves. Um, because you can see it in the coffee uh, sector in Nicaragua, it's been helped quite a bit by NGOs, and that moves fine. But other sectors are, are still struggling with the same problems that they were facing 20 years ago. So this is something, uh, yeah. Can I ask for any other? Yes, please. Let me find you as No, I come from the NGO sector and also the private sector. So I have this twofold approach. And uh, I was uh, thinking about the way the NGO behaved vis a vis your company, that is to say, uh, uh, drawing, in fact, from, from your experience. Uh, uh, until a moment it decided, okay, it might be more interesting to work with another player. And maybe uh, they had, in fact, a, a short-term view uh, of the, the needs uh, of the uh, cocoa growers, uh, in fact. So they probably had good intentions. Uh, they wanted to uh, maximize the profits for the local growers. Uh, and then they decide, oh, how can we do that? It's probably not with that guy and his uh, chocolate uh, uh, production system. Maybe it is safer to go and see this very large German company because they will uh, uh, buy uh, the uh, cocoa and maybe at a higher price um, and on a sustainable basis. So my question is the following. How uh, can... Uh, uh, we also make sure the smallholders have a long-term view so that we can have this overall long-term sustainable approach, which would also include the idea of growing other things. So how can uh, we uh, mobilize the local energy in this more sustainable and integrated approach? Because I also worked in the field and I didn't uh, find this uh, uh, great interest of the small producers for long-term sustainable uh, development. Yes, you are correct in a certain sense. I mean, this big German company, of course, had much more buying power. Yes. Um, now, Thing was, I, you know, I'm also from. I also work for the UN, and I also I'm an anthropologist, actually. So, <laughs> and that's what maybe if I had been a pure business, I would have never sh shared these plans with the NGO. But I was open and hoping, and we were discussing with the NGOs, and they were promising us uh, private-public partnership projects. And the thing is, when they suddenly kept silent, and they gave no explanation and went their own way, that's when it's troubling. But in a certain sense, you're correct. Uh, and you're also right to say that the farmers are looking for long-term investors. They, they quite appreciate the cacao farmers, or the farmers that had cacao, because I will say cacao farmers, but actually most cacao farmers are doing lots of other things. So farmers who had cacao um, were also quite happy. Um, but. Um, how could I say? What I see now, so we've, we've got this link, and it's a long-term link, and that's actually excluding lots of other potential companies to develop in the local economy. Because now this very big multinational has been introduced, and has so much buying power that there's no, no room anymore for the local economy to develop. And that's where I see the danger. And, we're, and now, if this was a multinational doing this on its own, that's one thing, because with all the free trade agreements, this is possible. But they were actually using resources of, of development organizations to, 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 you know, to increase their market. And that's where I find it dubious, because aren't we as NGOs supposed to look at more, you know, a level, level playing field? Aren't we you know, supposed to look at the whole economy and not just supporting one business or, for that matter, one pharma cooperative or pharma cooperatives? And um, 
you know, I mentioned one, but this, is, this happened three times in five years, that we were promised things by NGOs. And they, after showing us how our plans went and went their own way. So it's not you know, one, a one-time thing. Thanks very much. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the importance of getting the broader business environment mm. right. Now, every year, the World Bank produces a report called Doing Business, which mm. is aiming mm -hmm. to yeah. find all of those improvements to the institutional, legal, infrastructural mm -hmm. network through bu which business happens. Are you saying then that maybe the World Bank's got it right? Well, I think it's very important to look at uh, local, uh, local business laws and tax systems. It's very important. Um, um, well, how could I say? <laughs> what I do mention when talking to the World Bank uh, in Nicaragua is that they had a very little view of the actual facts on the ground. Um, and this is one of the positive things which I do see when NGOs get involved in business in developing countries, that they might face the same reality and learn from this experience and actually start pushing for changes in laws and business laws. Peut-être en complément à votre question. There's also a, a, a big, big responsibility on the NGO side that come with large funding, you know? Uh, so asking the, the, the poor to refuse this uh, financial potential, it's maybe uh, asking a bit too much from them. And there's uh, the, the, the funding agencies or institutions have also to think about what is the best way to invest. Another thing, you know, uh, 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 we uh, are here uh, and answering your questions, but other people in the audience might have an answer to give you. Mm. A, a strong view expressed in relation to NGOs getting involved, becoming the creatures often of big corporations in order to help open up markets for poor producers. I mean, are NGOs getting too much dragged in, willingly very often, to, to this body of work? Should they perhaps be a bit more critical and stand back? What, what's, what's the feeling in the room? Yes, here we've got my colleague. Good morning. I'm more in the private sector. I work for an industrial company. And uh, I have a question. As a private company, we have the following dilemma. You know, if uh, we uh, do not uh, uh, cover, answer the, the, the problems of our businesses, uh, uh, the development won't be a sustainable development because in case of a crisis, uh, it is maybe the first things we will drop. So we say, OK, to do development as a private company, we will in fact uh, deal with uh, our own problems and the problems of our uh, uh, operators. And this is uh, the uh, approach we use. In fact, we use our, our interests, our business, our jobs uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to do development. And if we move away from our interests uh, and stakes, well, we're, uh, we, in fact, uh, uh, cannot convince our operational people. Uh, so. Uh, uh, in this way, we get involved with development projects that have, in fact, little connection with our business, and they, they don't have many chances to succeed. So this is a, a big dilemma for us. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to respond to, to this dilemma we have as a private company. Questions of the live stream that we'd like to bring in at this point? We 
have someone online saying when uh, fair trade increases and starts, uh, uh, when you start getting involved with big businesses, they have the impression that the attention is only on price and all the other aspects like uh, capacity building for the producers or local added value is ignored. So uh, once you get involved with fair trade and big companies, the only uh, uh, thing people focus on is price. So this is the only uh, comment we have from Unrist. Well, uh, this brings us back to the bamboo story. That is to say, the price is the indicator for possible redistribution. That is to say, if we can uh, uh, guarantee that bamboo will be sold 15% more, it's probably enough uh, to ensure local development. Others say, no, that's not sufficient. How can we better redistribute and what do we do with the margin we obtain and uh, how can we make sure it is redistributed locally uh, and that it will be done on a sustainable basis? But, um Organic certification or rainforest alliance, all the certification—it's—it's it's actually uh, a step. I mean, it's only been started about 15, 15 years ago, and it, it it does give some basic rules and standards for the producer and for the buyer. Um, of course, let's say a fair trade uh, does give a minimum production, so a, a minimum price. So if market prices go be below a minimum price the producers are still um, guaranteed. But one of the big debates, of course, is what is the larger impact of all this, uh, the, cert uh, the certification uh, systems? And there's, been, there's now a lot of pressure coming in from, from NGOs, but also from industry, towards uh, fair trade or rainforest alliance to actually start increasing training to farmers to, to have a better, more sustainable impact and not just on price. So this is something that, that people in the sector are aware of. And and people are working for it. Just, just, uh, I don't know if that answers the question. Who else would like to, to come in on these, these questions? Of, of the, as our last um, intervener noted, that as somebody in the private sector, it's important to keep your eye on what the commercial advantage is rather than think that you can become an NGO or a broader development mm -hmm. project. Do you think this, this question of clearly defined roles um, and negotiating from that clearly defined role is better than maybe NGOs morphing into commercial organizations, um, commercial organizations taking on much more of a development role. What are people's thoughts? Yes, Jérôme. Four years ago, IRAM was appointed to do a cross-cutting assessment of the support offered by French NGOs to uh, exporting uh, structures in uh, uh, developing countries. And uh, what we saw at the time is close to many things that were said today. That is to say that uh, too often people uh, only focused on the exported product and uh, ignored the other economic resources at the local level. And in some cases, it increased social and economic uh, inequalities that existed uh, uh, at the local level. And uh, uh, another point concerning what Camilla has said. Yes, sometimes the NGOs will specialize and sometimes uh, uh, replace uh, uh, a marketing organization. And one of the conclusions of that work was, you know, a recommendation to NGOs was take some distance, look at the players, and keeping in mind your objectives, that is to say reducing inequalities, strengthening the local people, focus on those bigger objectives and do not, uh, you know, uh, uh, make a mistake when it comes to what is your actual and your real mission.
Yes, please, just behind. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Yeah, good morning. My name is Ernan O'Cleary. I work in the Development Assistance Committee uh, of the OECD. Um, I just wanted to address a bit more, maybe broaden out the issue of focus, um, <clears throat> because the way we seem to have been talking so far, and both as a criticism and an opportunity of what has been going on, is about focusing on products around which there is an economic opportunity. And if, we, if the issue is about making markets work for the poor, it doesn't strike me that that's the correct way to start focusing on, on, on what you're doing. Uh, because you're picking a market based on the commercial opportunities of the product you're interested in. So either bamboo or, 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 or cacao in, in, the, in the cases we're talking about this morning. Whereas it would seem that if you want markets to work for the poor, the important markets to look at are the markets that are important for the poor and the ones on which they base their livelihoods. And for, for, for many people, in, in, particularly in the poorest developing countries and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, these are basic food crop markets. They're the food staples, they're made their cassava, their rice, uh, their sorghum, their millet, uh, their, their uh, banana, these sorts of things. Yet we very rarely see um, uh, people looking at those markets because actually they're much more difficult. You know, they, aren't, they don't link easily into, uh, into export markets except regionally. Uh, they don't have big commercial opportunities in them and they work very inefficiently. The inefficiencies that Harm was talking about in terms of the market of cacao, of cacao they're worse actually in, 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 in many basic food staples. It's a much more difficult and intractable problem and in a sense it seems to me that there's a lot of uh, a, a desire, a, an understandable but inevitable desire to focus on things on, on things which can be seen to work and projects and interventions that can be seen to be successful and uh, are we really focusing on the markets that are important for the poor and trying to make them work? Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a very helpful comment I think on which we may get further reflection. Yes, please. Work. It helps me to try to uh, express my own question, which is completely naive and without any theory behind. I'm an anthropologist, but that helped me to learn to be as open as possible for reality. So, uh, following your question, maybe it's only a question, eh? and it's a free association more than a, than a very focalized question. There is a difference, I think, between small entrepreneurs who are going to work in a, yeah, what can I say, not agricultural, uh, you have the, of course the peasants, and you have the people who work in small companies more with technology, let us say. And maybe one of the things that we have to ask ourselves coming from Europe, we and again this morning I hear the same story, we are not capable to break through this opposition. Uh, we only think in dual, duality. And we have a wish, especially Olivier wishes, to break through this ideology. And we are not ca capable, with all the texts I read, it's always the same difficulty we have in our heads and in our hearts maybe, that we think we have a triangle, but the triangle, the poor, let us say, is not really there. And um, I mean, he is there in some aspects, but a peasant, feels different, thinks different. He doesn't think in that commercial way as a big company. And maybe the peasant is right in the first place because he has to work with the land, with the rain, with the difficulties, with the fat, fat, fact that there is nothing that can help me to develop the, the land. And I think that one of the mistakes that we make ourselves is that again, like in Europe, we do not really listen to the rhythm of the peasants. And if we do dare to say stop, stop moving with this globalization, hey, of course it's there, but the peasant has another rhythm. He knows that the land has to rest, for example. And listen to his logic or her logic and giving more space, more transitional space to that, is that not one of the, yeah, the things we could do in discussions like this one? Open question. Can I add something? 
Um, yeah, Sarah from SNV. I just want to jump in. Maybe that's why I immediately took the, the microphone. I also wanted. I also ask myself this question, and then I ask myself the question: Who is the market? Who is determining the market? Is it the consumer? Is it us NGOs? Is it the peasant? I think we all know the answer. But if you say we we need to follow more the rhythm of the peasant, what does it mean actually? What does it mean for the consumer? What does it mean for the multinationals? What does it mean for NGOs? Indeed, I think we bring, I think we bring to this agenda our own particular rhythms, our own particular needs, yeah. um, which mean that uh, we don't necessarily uh, provide the space and time for other key actors in, in the process. Harm, yeah, give us I, your thoughts. Yeah. Uh, when I um, started this business, my, my main goal was uh, local production and also to give uh, local knowledge to people to see if they could do more with the products they already had. And in Nicaragua, of course, cacao is a major product. and. Um, so all, all our sales are basically local, yeah. All, all, and um, because I see all, our whole production system and, and sales are all within Nicaragua and Honduras. So we got everybody, the whole network benefits from that. Not only farmers, but distributors, supermarkets, shops, uh, our electrician. You know, so many people more are, are benefiting. What we also did was uh, one of my reasoning is if you give people knowledge about their local products. Um, they also can increase quality. Um, so we gave a lot of trainings to farmers on how to make chocolate in the farm. And so they could actually get, to give knowledge on how people can actually do more with what they have. So maybe this is one of some of my, uh, my ideology. And, uh, and if I look back at Europe, I mean, uh, French cheese was developed here. We did, French did not start exporting cheese until they had totally <laughs> developed their own market. <laughs> And same with uh, Heineken was a Dutch company selling to Dutch people locally before they went abroad, and this is very important. This is what gives us all the jobs and the, the multiple all the companies involved directly with getting this product product from farmer to market. They're all here, and this is, this is something I, I sometimes miss in, in in developing countries because we're all so concentrated on export. But lo we've in Europe we've all developed the products here and marketed our products here. So. Would people like to pick up that point on the importance of developing local markets for local produce rather than this focus on the global? Uh, Lila. I'm Lila Buckley from IAED. Um, not actually directly related to that last comment. Um, since NGOs have, since NGOs have um, taken a bit of a hit in this discussion, I thought I would add a voice from an NGO. Um, I worked with a Chinese NGO in China for several years, and we were involved in exactly what we're discussing today, um, engaging smallholder producers, trying to think about how to develop market chains in China to um, support development on the ground in very rural areas of Western China. And much of our analysis coming out of that experience was very positive. We talked about how we developed you know, farmer cooperatives and profiled farmers who were able to send their, their children to college because of the income that they made. Um, but if you peel that back one layer, we found also that there was incredible inequalities that came out of those successes. Not everyone benefited equally and not everyone um, was able to send their children to college. Some people were excluded from the project. And so I think it's really important to see the perspective on the ground that NGOs can cause real harm. Um, and I would just like to add the observation that a lot of those problems can come from the fact that we tend to focus on the successes. And that doesn't leave room for discussion and learning and responsiveness to what the needs are on the ground. And I think the other layer of NGO work is advocacy and research and um, bringing those lessons into the international community. And it's really important in the work that we do to influence international development processes to create room for that kind of reflection and responsiveness.
Yes. Can I? Sorry. Please. Uh, maybe uh, maybe I have my own bias. Like I said, uh, most of my career I've been working in West Africa, mostly in the is it work. Yeah. yeah, most in the cotton belt. Maybe we go a little too, too far now. For me, there is no contradiction between export markets and domestic uh, domestic markets. I think we go too far. We make it too simple again. So there is no for cotton farmers. There is no there. There is well also the the cereal cereal producers of. Uh, West Africa, and at the same time, the cotton. So maybe we make it too too simplistic in this dichotomy, uh, Baram. You you go a little bit too far. It it starts to become a problem if all investments goes to one side and not not to the other side. But of course, they will export and they will look as much as they can. So you need also devices from from abroad. So uh, maybe a little bit nuances uh, in the, at this side. <laughs> I wanted to make a comment uh, connected to what Jerome said in his introduction. When we look uh, at the market for the poor approach, there, there, there's nothing in there to promote tools. It can cover many, many things. And uh, uh, for me, the sectoral approach can be interesting because you see the sharing of added value. And if you look at where does the added value go, and if we consider that a lot of this added value is to stay at the local level, then we can decide, OK, uh, 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 with this sector, this chain, everything uh, goes to the uh, uh, northern countries, so it's not appropriate. And uh, another conclusion saying, ah, this uh, uh, added value is more shared locally, it could be a more interesting approach. For this first half, I'd like to thank very much our, our two presenters and say, I think we've um, seen this interesting kind of dichotomy between the importance of focusing on a particular product and what that can bring versus a much broader improvement in the general business environment with quite a lot of emphasis on the importance of the latter. Um, we've seen a discussion around um, the importance of developing markets for export and the potential that that can bring in terms of higher prices and revenues for smallholders versus the need to tackle the often much harder problems of local markets. Um, I think we also have to remember that we should kind of watch what farmers do as well as um, think that we've got all the answers and that we need to test out our theory by getting involved in the practical engagement of seeing how these different markets work um, in reality. I think um, we're going to hear in the next half how this engagement in markets also then feeds back into a whole set of issues around family, household, and the management of those fundamental resources on which agriculture is based, soils, land, and water. But we're going to take a break now for 15 minutes and have some coffee. So let's have some, oh, 10 minutes. OK, 10 minutes. So <laughs> quick coffee, and then we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Thanks very much. Thank you.